Uh, hello, Professor Dustin here, and this video is going to be an introduction to eye telescope and really how to take the very first image that you're going to take with eye telescope. Um, if you're watching this, you should have already watched the introduction videos um, that I probably sent over to you already. There's like three longer ones, which are general introductions to eye telescope, and then there's two shorter ones to introduce you to the um, new setup, the, the new format of eye telescope. So if you've watched those and you're ready to get into this one. This video is just all about taking an image with eye telescope. It doesn't matter of what. It doesn't matter of what telescope. I just want you to experience the whole decisions you have to make to take an image. Uh, how do you decide when an object is visible? Which telescope to use? Um, focusing on the things we're going to be doing in this research project. Not sort of, you know, because people use eye telescope for all kinds of stuff. We have specific things. This is just going to sort of get you into some of the things we care about when we're taking images. Not everything. Um, and in the end, maybe you'll get a pretty picture of something, right? That's really what the goal is here. Um, so first, this is just the, uh, the main eye telescope page. You can see that all the little dots showing you where all the telescopes are. For various reasons, we focus on the Australia, Spain, and New Mexico telescopes. That's not going to be the case forever, but that's kind of what we focus on now. First thing I want to do is decide what object I want to take a picture of. Normally, I will probably be telling you this information, but for this trial, basically, if you have something you want to take a picture of, go for that, right? Like, let's start with an object that you're interested in. Um, I do this with a lot of students. Here's the web page showing a lot of the pretty pictures that we've taken so far. You can see there's a lot of galaxies. We have one nice nebula picture here. Um, and you can see I've written which telescopes we've used, T14, T18, and such. Uh, but these are, we got a cluster, but we don't have a lot of nebula. So I think I'm going to take a picture of a nebula. I'm going to do M1. M1 is the crab nebula, um, because I believe that it will be visible tonight from New Mexico, but I'm not sure. I have to check that. So first thing I'm going to do is decide M1 is the object I want to look for. Uh, if you don't know your uh, M objects, they are called Messier objects. They are the brightest non-stellar objects in the sky. You can go to Wikipedia and get a cool list. This is what M1 looks like for various reasons. That's not what my picture is going to look like, but this is what I'm going to start with, is trying to take a picture of M1. So, sorry, let me close this. So to, to determine if something is up in the sky, you need a planetarium program. Um, there are very good ways of determining when something is op you know, uh, optimally placed for observation with eye telescope, but for the moment we want to do the simplest possible thing, and the simplest possible thing is using Stellarium. And just a quick note, I'm doing this on a Linux machine, you're probably on a Mac or a PC, so when I'm interacting with my computer, that will look nothing like what you are doing, but once I open the programs, the programs themselves and eye telescope should look basically identical. So I'm going to start Stellarium. That's how you start Stellarium on a Linux machine. And it's going to give me a nice view of the sky. So to determine whether something is up in the sky right now, I need to first go to the right place on Earth, right? We have a bunch of telescopes. So to do that, I'm going to go over to this window, and there's a location window right here. And it's also pushing F6. So either push F6 or click that. And then you get a map of the world, and it looks like I am currently somewhere in Great Britain, maybe, or uh, I don't know about France. Uh, so I want to get to New Mexico so I can just type in New Mexico and really you can see that there's several places in New Mexico I could go to. Any one of them is fine. Once you're in the right state or even the right approximately geographical area, you're going to have basically an idea of when something's going to be up. So I'm going to go to Roswell and you can see the sky changed a little bit as I went to Roswell. The current time can be seen at the bottom. It's 8.32 in the morning. Uh, that's the current time in Roswell, I guess. Uh, but I want to do it at night, right? So I'm going to change the time to be night time. So there's a date, uh, date time window right there, also pushing out five. And you can see the 22nd. This is when I'm making the video at 832. That's like two hours behind what I am, or three hours behind my local time. But I want to make it the local time of night in New Mexico. So I'm just going to advance the time up. So now it's like nighttime. OK, so now when I drag around the screen, and I would encourage just playing around with uh, Solarium a little bit if you like. You can click and drag and look all kinds of nifty stuff there. It's Orion. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, Stellarium is very cool. So I want to see if M1 is going to be up um, in the sky tonight. So I'm going to do that by searching. So go over here to the search window, also pushing F3, and just type in M1, enter, and it zipped over to M1. Cool, M1 is up. And so there's a one little piece, there's lots of information up here, but the number one thing we want to look at is the altitude. You want to take pictures of objects at their highest point in the sky. That's because you'll be looking through the least amount of atmosphere. So you can tell that by the altitude. So there's this one line here, azimuth, altitude, azimuth, you can ignore, but the altitude is what we care about. You can see right now at 6.30, right, uh, military time, 18 is 6. 
uh, altitude is 38. You want to be above 30 degrees in general, and the higher, the better. So really, the best way to do this is to try to estimate when the object will be above 30 degrees and when it will be highest. So um, I think if I go backwards, yeah, see, if I go backwards in time, this is now 530. Not only is it too bright, but also the object went down. So it went down to 26. So somewhere around, it, it, it don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be exact, but somewhere around 6 o'clock. So you can see between 5.30 and 6.30, it crossed from uh, under, under 30 degrees to over 30 degrees. So somewhere around 6 o'clock. Now I'm going to advance the time forwards to try to see where it hits its maximum. You can see 51, 63. And I'm just going ahead in hours because I'm just trying to get an estimate. 74, so it's still getting higher. 78, getting higher. 70, so somewhere around 22, 34. So that's like 10 o'clock is uh, 10.30 maybe. That's called transiting. So when the object is highest in the sky, it's transiting. So that's the word that is associated with that. Um, so that's the optimal time to take the, the picture, but I also wanna know how low it gets before it drops, but sorry, what time it is before it drops below 30 degrees, because I might not get the right time on eye telescope. I wanna get as close to 2230 as I possibly can, but maybe that time will be reserved already and I have to go on either side of it. So I wanna know what kind of flexibility I have. So I'm gonna keep advancing time, so 70 degrees, 58 degrees, 46, 33. So now I'm basically there. So that's 2.30. So base, something like 3 o'clock. And I'm writing these numbers down just as notes to myself. So what I figured out is M1 will be above the horizon in New Mexico between 6 uh, p.m. and 3 a.m. with a transit time of about 10.30. So I'm going to look for 10.30 to be the optimal time. But I can go um, on either side of that. If uh, Just to show you. There's one other thing which you really have to be careful about when you're taking pictures, and that is where is the moon? So at 1030, there's no moon. And I've, I've made this image by zooming out uh, on Hans Twitter. But if I go backwards, you can see the moon is right there. The moon is a huge problem for astronomy. You may or may not be aware of that. So if the moon is up, you kind of don't want to take pictures. Sometimes we have no choice. But in this case, obviously, earlier in the night, the moon is higher and higher and brighter and brighter. So I am very motivated to stay away from the moon. So if I can really go, this is 1030. So if I can really get to 1030 or later, that is better because the moon is not up. Okay, that's a bit too much information for just taking an estimated picture. But anyway, there you go. So that's like, that's like close Stellarium and bounce back over to eye telescope. <clears throat> Sorry, I opened some stuff here. So I'm going to pick a telescope to use. You can use any telescope you want for this exercise. Uh, I'll show you the quick list of the ones we commonly use is right here. T5, T11, T21 in New Mexico, T7 in Spain, Australia, T17, 30, 31. That list changes as they update the telescopes and change them. You can pick whatever you want, but these are the telescopes we'll generally focus on for various reasons that I won't go get into now. Anyway, T5, T11, T21 are what I'm looking at. So let's Pick T21, I happen to know it's the biggest one of that list, so it's the nicest one to use. Click that, it will open into the telescope um, options here and give you some basic information about it. Uh, you know, I might go to the reservation and look what kind of available time I have in this telescope, but I don't really care when this observation that I'm setting actually happens. So, you know, oh, there's a lot of time um, tonight, there's a lot of time on Saturday, so cool. Looks like we have lots of time. I want to be around 10:30. That's right there. Cool. Looks like it's going to be fine. So uh, you want to click Deep Sky. Now, there's various easier ways of taking images, right? One-click image allows you to like click a, uh, a. There's a bunch of nice images. In fact, there's probably M1 here. Oh, there's not an M1 here. Interesting. Uh, so you can do that, but we really are going to be using the Deep Sky function more often because we're going to have to punch in our own. So I'm going to make a plan, and I'm going to show you the various options that we will commonly use and uh, what we can use now to make a pretty picture. So plan file name, I usually name the file name. That's just for me. It's the target name, so I usually just name it the target name. The target, that's the name of your files once it spits out the files. I like to name that M1 as well um, to match the target. So when I'm looking at the files, I know what the files are. Now, when we do our work, we are probably not going to be able to do this next step, but because M1 is a common target, I should be able to get click, cor click get coordinates, and they should show up in there, and this they do. Target found Crab Nebula, that's because it's a very common object. Most of our objects will not be like that at the moment. We can do that if we get coordinates. So now, uh, sorry, these will be unchecked when we first get there. So now we need to select what kind of filters we want to use for this object. Now, normally, I'll be telling you which scientific filters to use. But for the purposes of this, let's um, get a bunch of color images, right? So let's uh, do 
uh, one image in red. Let's do one image in green and one image in blue. That will kind of ensure that we have, um, that we can combine those into a nice, hopefully pretty picture. I'm not being very careful here. I'm not thinking very carefully about things, so maybe it won't work, but like red, green, blue, that will allow us to combine it to maybe make a pretty picture. I actually don't know much about making pretty pictures. I mostly know how to do measurements and it's a little bit different thing, but the purposes of this exercise, let's shoot the pretty picture. Duration in seconds. For these bright uh, objects, you can see that I had 300 in here. That's for like a pretty dim object, that's five minutes. Um, this is a relatively bright object. Let's do uh, like 60 seconds in each. And actually, I think that I would like to do a little bit longer. Let's do 120 seconds in each. So that's a two minute exposure for uh, each filter. Uh, you could increase the number of filters uh, if you want to do that. I, actually, let's do that. Let's do that. Do, do two because I do want to show you stacking. So let's do two filters, 120 seconds each. And the binning, so the binning is a resolution thing. So, pic, so, so cameras are pixels, right? They're pixelated. Um, and if you bin one, then every single pixel acts on its own. That's a very high resolution, low sensitivity image. Uh, meaning that you'll get the highest resolution possible, but each pixel is only speaking for itself. So the, the sensitivity is rather low. If you pick binning two, that means that each little two by two pixel will get combined into a single two by two pixel. So you'll reduce the resolution by a factor of four, but you'll increase the sensitivity by a factor of four. I don't really care. Usually for pretty pictures, you want high resolution. So that's what I'm gonna do with one bit. Okay. And if you want more, you could do a whole bunch more filters, but I'm only gonna do three. Uh, so you can see these will be unchecked when you first get there. Advanced imaging options, I'm going to select the two that we typically use for our science photo. Dither uh, allows small position changes between images. That is beneficial when you're doing stacking for various reasons that I'll talk about. And plate solve. So plate solve is actually really important. It is very slow. You can see the warning here, but we actually really, really want to plate solve our images because it will save time for us on the back end. This will put a coordinate system on the images. So we know exactly what the coordinates on the sky um, are on the images. Anyway, there's a nice test plan. I'm gonna create the plan for later. Uh, don't do acquire images now. I'm assuming you're not doing this in the middle of the night. If you're doing it in the middle of the night, you could click that and you could go right over the telescope. But I'm doing this in the morning, so create the plan for later. Plan save to m1.txt. It's now saved on the iTelescope server. So now to make a reservation, I go to make a reservation. <laughs> And you can see the reservation window here. And you can see, I think this, this is Thursday. Today is Friday. So actually this is last night. So this is why it's empty is I can't reserve time for the time in the past, but here's Friday. Um, yeah, I think I might as well try to, it, well, the best time was right here and here the moon was up, right? The moon was up at like, uh, it didn't set till like 10 o'clock. So actually I'm gonna do them the next day. Um, you can just click and drag to reserve time. This is way too much time, but let me show you what the next window will show you. <clears throat> so and then, then you get this reservation window. Uh, the thing that we have to look at is we recommend a reservation duration 1.5 your total imaging time. So what's my total imaging time? I had two images, two minutes, three filters. So that's two times two times three is 12. So 12 total minutes of imaging time. They want, they, they recommend a reservation duration of 1.5 times that. So 12 times 1.5 would be 18. I normally just double it and do and then round, you know, egregiously. The thing is that we get charged for the amount of imaging time, not for the reservation time. So actually doing like an hour of reservation time where everything is fine, it's way too much time. But you know, let me just do 1030 to 11. But the point is that we don't get charged for how much we reserve. So always over reserve, you only get charged the amount of time the telescope actually runs. Select a plan. I have a whole bunch of plans in here. Then you can see some stuff that I've been like testing and playing around with. Here's M1. You can add a comment to yourself if you want, but the important thing here is to click reschedule. So generally, we want an image of something regardless of whether it takes it that night or the next night. And if you click reschedule, it will try to reserve that same time slot for you the next night if, you, if it gets bumped because of clouds and stuff like that. We generally want to do that. Now, if you're like trying to get in a, a, a transit of an exoplanet or something which is only happening at one given time, you don't want to do that. But for our purposes, we generally just want to get images of the objects as soon as possible. So confirm reservation. So now you just wait. Now you just wait until you can see that my name has popped up there. You can actually move these around if you feel like you want to change the position a little bit um, of your reservation. But uh, anyway, you're now all set. So iTelescope will send you an email as the reservation uh, 
approaches and then we'll also send you an email once it's finished. And so I'm gonna have another video which is gonna talk about what kinds of emails you get from iTelescope to explain what to do there. But that's the end of this, uh, this step. You're ready to hurry up and wait for iTelescope to take images. You can do stuff like, you know, you can go down here and look at the telescope info. So I don't really remember what this is. All the outside camera. You can look at what the, what the sky looks like right now. It's obviously during the day, so you can't see anything. Um, so you, but you can like watch, let's see, how do you, oh, system status. Yeah, you can like watch what's happening on the telescope by looking at the system status. Uh, let's see, let's just jump over to, uh, Australia's at night. So let's pop over there and we can see what it looks like at night. because you can watch the telescope take your images if you want. It doesn't really, we don't need that functionality. We're fine just waiting, but so if I click on the system status of the telescope. Oh yeah, see it's doing stuff, it's calibrating stuff. It tells you where the telescope's pointed at, what the observatory is doing. It's currently idle, it's not doing anything at the moment, but here's an all sky image. You can see it's a little cloudy, but there's definitely some sky up there. So maybe someone's gonna be using it. You can look at the telescope info. Anyway, now I'm just sort of rambling about it. Telescope. So we're done. Um, thanks for watching. Hope this has been helpful. In the next video, we'll talk about what to do once you get the images.